The lead character in my graphic novel is Barbara, the made-up makeup girl, who is your classic high-maintenance single girl. She spends a lot of her time engaging in beautifying rituals. Barbara may appear to be a living Barbie, but she reflects the great effort many everyday women put into their appearance. Andrea Dworkin noticed that, from the age of 11 or 12 until she dies, a woman will spend a large part of her time, money and energy on binding, plucking, painting and deodorizing herself. Naomi Wolf in The Beauty Myth infamously describe how these beautifying rituals act to increase the already significant pay divide between men and women. This may reinforce the popular myth that women are narcissistic or their own worst en enemies, but in fact it reflects Foucault's idea of internalised self-control. Barbara has this idea of an inner person trapped in an outer shell. She talks of finding someone who loves her on the inside and feels men judge her too much by her outside appearance. This is partly because Barbara very much performed the act of being a woman and feels the burden of this role, and partly because she has a secret that keeps her inner world separate from her outer one. Barbara, of course, also reflects Judith Butler's infamous gender performance theory. Judith Butler explored the significance of the idea of inner and outer bodies and concluded that although they are just linguistic terms, they express a set of fantasies, fears and desires. Like Burkett in 1999, she emphasizes the importance of the surface of the body in acting as the site of the performance of gender through acts, gestures and words, and giving the illusion of an essential inner gender. She argues this performance of gender sustains masculine domination and compulsory heterosexuality. But Barbara also reflects our human fascination with changing and shaping our bodies. The joy we get when having a new haircut, losing weight or buying new clothes. Though many comics and films have played with the desire to transform. This pleasure is evident in the process of drawing and shaping comic caricatures. It is evident in the way both male and female artists take pleasure in creating sexualized female comic characters who reinforce discourse on what is attractive. The final two characters I am going to explore are Janet and Marion. Janet is a divorced dietitian in her 50s who runs a weight loss group. She is a woman in control who prides herself on her own fixed stone weight loss, a case of mind over matter, as she likes to tell her clients. But then one night at 12 o'clock exactly, she is woken by a distressing phone call from a group of women who call themselves the Midnight Feast Front. They feast down the phone and whisper recipes Nigella Lawson style. Night after night, Janet is driven mad by the sound of Welching jam donuts, slurp jelly, and wobbling trifles. Finally, she meets Marion, who, without giving too much away, is the head of the Midnight Feast Front. She is hedonistic, viewing clothes as restrictive, monogamy as imprisoning, and diet as self mutilation. Throughout the book, she grows and grows bigger and bigger, but in her quest to free her body from society's shackles, is she ignoring its biological limits? I created Janet and Marion as characters I believe many women have inside their bodies, jostling for control or freedom. These two women are very much influenced by Susan Bordel's unbearable weight in 1993, which observed the rise in both anorexia and obesity in the West. Bordeaux recognizes this schizophrenic culture in our society, where magazines and television constantly flip between telling us to indulge and treat ourselves, and the other telling us to exercise self-restraint. This results in the paradox of an epidemic of anorexia in a society with an increasing overweight majority. 
Bordeaux examines how adverts reveal how women's relationship with food has always been fraught with emotional highs and lows, and the danger of losing control. Likewise, their hunger for food has come to represent not just an appetite, but a sexual appetite. Marion was first imagined as a grotesque caricature of Nigella Lawson, the epitome of the sexualized eating. I have included a scene in this book to this effect when Marion says to a man, I want you inside me. He takes this to mean sex, but actually she wants to eat him. Having finished my graphic novel, I was surprised to read Susan Bordeaux's Unbearable Weight in full and to come across a description of the man-eating woman figure in mythology. Here we have the Cali and Woodblock prints of man-eating witches, and of course, we also have modern-day man-eating. Bordeaux says, Eating is not really a metaphor for the sexual act. Rather, the sexual act, when initiated and desired by a woman, is imagined as itself an act of eating, of incorporation and destruction of object of desire. Thus, women's sexual appetite must be curtailed and controlled, because they threaten to deplete and consume the body and soul of the male. Barbara Creed talks of Freud's concept of vagina dentata, the teeth vagina that appears in many myths, from Native American folklore to Japanese mythology. Freud claimed it represented men's castration fears, but perhaps also, in the light of Bordeaux's writing, this is the same fear of the hungry, out-of-control woman. My character Marion and the Midnight Feast Front were supposed to be subversive, a tongue-in-cheek way of challenging society's dominant discourse. But theories such as Bordeaux and Orbach have noticed a very real aggression towards those bodies in our society. They are viewed as fat, lady, and hedonistic and greedy. This is echoed in the many hysterical headlines worrying about our nation's obesity crisis. Comic artists and zine makers have also responded against this. Here we see Big Bum, which is a fat feminist zine published in 2008 by Charlotte Cooper and Bill Savage. And here is Creeper Joshi the Miss Moti, which was also showing an alternative experience of embodiment. Bordeaux says, In the case of the obese in particular, what is perceived as a defiant rebellion against normalization appears to be the source of the hostility they inspire. The anorectic, at least, pays homage to dominant cultural values. This leads us to Janet, the dietitian living downstairs, whose body represents the dominant cultural values of self-control and strength of mind, which are also, of course, masculine values of control over emotions in one's body. Callie Whithead and Tim Kerr's in 2008 examined women's magazines and concluded that the images of anorectic were read as more positive, powerful and feminine than images of the obese. They draw parallels with Hepworth's 1999 analysis of yet another dichotomy, Madonna versus the whore. The Madonna is seen as representing virtuosity, self-restraint and control, and as a metaphor for the ideal of the mind firmly in control of the body. In contrast, the whore is seen as representing sin, self-indulgence, and lack of control, and as a metaphor for the body being firmly in control of the mind. This idea has its roots in early Christian practice, where fasting and self-restraint took one's soul out of the prison of their sinful body and nearer to God. Lawrence, 1979. Bordeaux confesses she had always struggled with understanding how a physically reduced, weak, slender body could be viewed to represent so much power, liberation, and attractiveness in modern society. She cites Foucault as helping her come to terms with this paradox in his explanation of how bodies internalize control and normalize these oppressive rituals as pleasurable. But perhaps there is also an active 
subversion in the anorexic's decision to reject female rule. Bordeaux further considers how women are often preoccupied with fighting fleshy, wobbly areas, with much emphasis on the stomach and starving themselves to the point that their periods stop, and that this may be part of expressing rebellion against maternal domestic femininity. This talk has explored how the sociology, sociological study of bodies can be equally applicable to the body in the comic. From the pleasure the artist has in creating bodies that adhere to social norms, to the subversiveness of creating bodies that challenge them. And in turn, the effect of image of the body can have on the reader's body. I have attempted to show how I have explored social bodily anxiety on the characters in my graphic novel The House That Groaned, viewing the series of Norbert Elias to Judith Butler and Susan Bordeaux. Of course, I hope, in dissecting my book today, I have not taken the fun out of analysing it yourself. There are undoubtedly layers of symbolism and discourse I have unconsciously included and leave it to you to interpret it as you will. I would like to leave you with one final quote from Susie Orbach's 2009 book, Bodies. In our belief that the body is almost infinitely modifiable, we have become prey to industries and practices which frequently increase our sense of insecurity. We aren't being creative with our bodies and having fun with them. We are rather building bodies in the hope that we will create bodies that make us feel better about ourselves. Let us hope comic artists continue to use their unique powers of the medium to create challenging, subversive and creative bodies. Thank you very much. You can find out more about Carrie Franceman's comics at www.carriefranceman.com and more about her graphic novel The House That Groaned at www.thehousethatgroaned.com Thank you.